Are you a sexy, indulgent musician suffering from consistent long hours, crippling self-doubt, and constant disappointment? Well, do we have a show for you. Welcome to Sex, Drugs, and Disappointment, a bi-weekly deep dive into what it takes to be a healthy and successful musician in the modern industry. My name is Melody Kaiser. And I'm Dustin Williams. And we are both full-time musicians and creative entrepreneurs. And today we are discussing how to practice efficiently and effectively as a musician. Okay, let's get real. Practicing kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, it is essential to developing uh, your um, techniques and your ear training and just general knowledge of your instrument or your craft. Um, whether you're a beginner or professional, uh, practice is just a huge part of, uh, of playing and should be part of your daily routine if you can make it happen. Yeah, I mean, I will say for myself, I'm not the kind of person um, that has like a practice log. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, not that organized with it. But I do think kind of coming up with a strategy of how you can approach practicing, you don't have to necessarily write it down, which I know a lot of people would disagree with me mm -hmm. on that point. But I, I've never done it. And I feel like, you know, I, I'm fine without writing it down. But we basically just wanted to like give you some ideas of how to make your practice um, more efficient. And, and more effective. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like you were saying, so basically splitting it into a routine, uh, splitting your routine into steps is, is kind of the most effective way, at least for me. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of suggest like splitting your practice routine into four sections. So we have at first kind of practice some techniques, which we're going to get more into. Uh, practice some ear training. Um, that's really important just for applying yeah. musical skill mm -hmm. um and, and we'll get more into that uh and then obviously review songs or techniques that you already know and always push yourself every time you practice to learn at least one thing that's new mm -hmm. yeah whether um, it's a song or again a technique or something you can always uh add something new to to your uh vocabulary as a musician sure yeah and and obviously we're coming from we're both string players um, but I think it, this is pretty generally true for all instruments. We may yeah. not have the exact um, advice on what to practice for necessarily like drums or piano or anything like that. But I think all of these things can be applied and you can just learn uh, more about your particular instrument Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and when you go to apply them. But um, so let's start with techniques. Yeah. So um, obviously for like drums and stuff like that, this would probably be rudiments and just general you know, making sure that you're not using your arms, kind of using more of your wrist and that kind of movement. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to mostly talk about guitar and bass because that's what we both play. So, um, Dustin, why don't you start? What okay. do you practice when you go to practice bass techniques? Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So um, I would say like your picking technique is, is probably like one of the first things you're really going to want to focus on. Um, and this is again, whether you're a beginner or, or an advanced player. Um, but certain things like, you know, essentially economy picking, um, with your fingers, uh, and, and you can, obviously this applies to using a pick as well. I love playing bass with a pick, uh, sometimes. So, um, you know, it really just, it, it doesn't matter necessarily the style that you're practicing, but like, let's say you're, you're trying to work on your finger technique as a bass player. Um, when you run a scale, for example, like, a, um, a minor pentatonic, let's say a minor pentatonic, as you ascend the scale in, let's say position one, um, you're going to alternate ideally, uh, your fingers for each note, right? So if you start on a, you're going to start with, I don't know, your middle finger, right? And then when you move to C, you'll use your index. And then that same thing continues throughout the rest of the scale. The thing is, when you're coming back down the other way, let's say you're starting on that last, uh, uh, on the G string at the uh, seventh fret, which would be a D. So you hit that D with your middle finger, and then you go to the C with your index finger well. The next note is going to be on the D string at the seventh fret. So what you want to do is rake that index finger from the G to the D string. So you know you're 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 essentially minimizing effort. So it's a style of economy picking, and that applies to again if you're using a pick, it's the same thing. You want to move in the direction of the string you're you're going to. So 
Um, you know, that's one thing. I mean, that's just like a very specific example. Can but... I add to that? Sure. It's just to kind of so that people really understand economy picking. <laughs> Basically, it's it, on guitar. It's the same idea. But usually you use a pick, obviously, because the strings are closer together and all that kind of stuff. But um, so basically economy picking, if you think of alternate picking as down, up, down, up, down, up, no matter what string you're on, you're constantly just going down, up, right? So economy picking is on guitar. The most famous person for using it is Eric Johnson, mm -hmm. who did Cliffs of Dover. If you don't know that song, look it up and you'll hear um, the his the way that he goes as quickly as he does. And it's actually just part of his technique is instead of going down, up in one motion, like you were saying, he'll rake. So he'll use his downstroke to go to the next string as well. Right, right. So, so instead of constantly going down up, he kind of goes down and then down on the next string. He uses that same motion to get basically two notes out. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to explain that so that people... No, kinda... yeah, that's that's great. Uh, it's essentially, you know, as, as the name implies in economy picking, economy of motion, right? If you're... If you're uh, if you play any sports at all, if you do martial arts or something, that's a thing that um, that they talk about a lot. Uh, you want to minimize the the effort that you are putting out um, because you want to save your energy, right? You want to be able to to have stamina. So that's a huge part of of that type of picking. Um, and then uh, actually, one thing we were talking about, Melody, you mentioned um, flat picking. This is like a thing that that you know people kind of get wrong as far as the definition would you mind explaining that sure so flat picking um <clears throat> is most commonly heard in like bluegrass music right um that's kind of the vocabulary word when you think of bluegrass guitar so like billy strings is the most recent example of that right so um people think that it literally means you have to hold your pick parallel to the strings and literally pick the string completely flat that is not actually what that means. So flat picking um, just means using a, what we think of as just a guitar pick, a flat pick. Mm -hmm. So it's not the technique itself. It's the tool is the flat pick. Yeah. Okay. So gotcha. um, no matter if you're using a flat pick, um, well, finger picking is obviously different. So, so when you're using a flat pick, you still want, um, and this is a technique that I practice all the time. You want it to all be in your wrist right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how you develop speed. Obviously, if it's in your whole arm and you're like tensing up, then you're not going to be fast. Right. So it's really important that it all stays in your wrist. Well, just the the motion of just using your wrist, you're going to turn the pick side, not completely sideways to the string. You don't want it to be perpendicular, but somewhere in between parallel and perpendicular. Yeah. And yeah. then that basically, I, I mean, it makes sense. So, so think about this. If you're Picking parallel to the string, the whole surface area of the pick is hitting the string. Right. So you're getting all this friction, which is really slowing you down. If you turn the pick a little bit to the side, you're really using like, well, the side of the pick and a little bit of the surface. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're basically decreasing the surface area, which helps decrease friction and that makes you faster. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's a really important technique to do really slow, um, especially at first, because it feels really weird to put it all in your wrist at first yeah it does it, it definitely yeah. does yeah and and it takes time like don't don't feel like well i just can't do this i can get frustrated like it, it's a it's it's like learning to walk again like <laughs> yeah, honestly yeah, yeah. It's, it's a weird feeling and especially for guitar and this is probably true for bass too up, up strokes are the weirdest mm -hmm. um and that's mostly because people tense up and they go parallel and then they're like a lot of times in beginner guitarists and i've just seen this for myself when people go to upstroke they're using it completely parallel. Mm -hmm. And so the pick will fall out of their hand or fall into the acoustic guitar or, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they're like, ah, like I can't do this, but it's really, um, it's really just that simple. It's literally just, I always tell people kind of when you're coming up, I think of it while well, your wrist is coming up. So now my thumb is kind of towards the sky mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in that motion, right. In that motion of your thumb turning towards the sky, your pick is going to turn. Yeah. Yeah. And, I would also, um, at least at least for bass, and and this is maybe specifically uh, in relation to like slap technique or or like double thumb technique, but to me they're kind of similar to pick technique because essentially you're just using your thumb as a pick. But um, when we say wrist, uh, I think it, it also kind of it's your forearm really. It's like the rotation of your forearm. Think about like twisting a doorknob. 
and it's it's not going to be the exact same motion but it's a similar idea where it's like it's a combination of your wrist uh movement plus your forearm kind of rotating and working together um again not like elbow movements right now you might like you know if you're an I mean, acoustic to player a, you to might a be degree doing, i mean yeah. it's all i mean obviously you're gonna move your elbow yeah, like yeah. If, if i broke my elbow i would realize i use it a lot more than i think i do you yeah, know what yeah, i mean yeah, like totally. mm-hmm. on guitar so mm-hmm. i mean it's not like extreme you don't have to completely lock your elbow into place but you just don't want all of the motion to come from your elbow yeah. if your wrist is completely still and you're all elbow not only are you going to look a little robotic, mm-hmm. it's going to sound robotic and it's going to feel super tense and weird. Yeah. So so obviously, you know, these things are just kind of general ideas. They're not, like I said, you don't have to lock your elbow in place or like not move your shoulder. Um, and you're right. So uh, electric guitar picking technique and acoustic guitar picking technique are actually different, mm-hmm. right? Because on acoustic, I mean, yeah, sometimes people play single notes, but more often than not, you're a rhythmic player yeah. when you're playing acoustic guitar. So what I mean by that is you're usually playing chords, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to play a strumming pattern, like a full chord and just all in the wrist. It feels weird. It doesn't sound as good. Yeah. So of course you're going to like kind of move your arm, right? Because right, right. you have to get six strings in, at the same time. <laughs> so like it's really hard yeah. to get six strings in a wrist movement without it feeling tense um and and i guess that's kind of the basic idea for most picking techniques in my opinion is you just don't want to be tense yeah you want it to just feel second nature and that takes practice it really does yeah um but just slowing it down and really working on that um is really really important um and i will say too obviously with acoustic guitars you have finger picking is is one of the most popular ways to play acoustic guitar and i think a lot of people struggle with it yeah and there's two approaches um, I'm a self-taught guitar player, so I like my approach better, <laughs> but I mean, it, cause it just works for me, but yeah. a classical guitar player, right? Obviously, if you ever look up classical guitar players, if you don't know like how they have to position themselves, right? Um, but their wrist never touches the body of the guitar or the mm, bridge. Right, it's right. always up, which is very uncomfortable for me. And I, it's probably just because I didn't learn that way. Mm-hmm. Um, it, to me, though, I have no spatial awareness when my wrist is up. Out like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That also doesn't it, seem like, I mean, I know like classical guitar has been around for a long time. It just seems like that wouldn't be the most effective for like Oh, when people are good stuff. at it, it's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there are different techniques, but yeah. in general, like your wrist is up. Yeah. Right? And okay. and it's it's basically like, of course, it's going to be quicker in some ways. And it, I think the idea that they're going for is it's a lot less energy waste because mm, it's okay. literally all in your fingers. It's not in your because when I pick so and this is what I recommend to people who are just um, wanting to finger pick and they're not they don't care about classical positioning. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I tell them and this is probably because I came from electric guitar and this is an electric guitar technique. I tell them, put your wrist on the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. And then for me, that immediately cements my wrist. And so I, I now have spatial awareness of where every single string is. It's an anchor point. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I now know. Um, and it, of course, that took practice, too. But I now know, like, oh, like, my thumb is on the E string. Now I can feel every single string. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I'm in open space, I, I don't know how heart players do it. I would have no idea where I'm at, <sighs> yeah. at at all. And, I, and I'm sure that that's just practice, too. But for me, like, not having awareness of where just spatial awareness is is really hard for me so there's obviously different approaches to it but if you're wanting to get into finger picking and um it's a real struggle for you try that so rest your hand on the bridge it also helps when you go to palm mute which is more of an electric technique in general but you use it on acoustic too but um that really helps me and um a lot of acoustic guitar players would disagree with that Um, just because, so when you do that, your thumb is kind of like on the base, like it's more of like a rotation Mm. instead of like straight and open air. So it's just a different approach. Um, but that really, really, that's how I finger pick and I I haven't had problems with it yet. (laughs) I mean, I may later, you know, but so far it's really helped for me. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's obviously like the right hand technique. Um, but there's also a lot of things you can do with your left hand when you're, your fretting hand. Right, um, right. For all you lefties out there, yeah, you're fretting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there we go. Um, so, um, for fretting techniques for guitar, I'll say like especially for beginners, the most important thing is to not let. Well, kind of like we were saying last week, don't let your hand 
touch the, don't let your whole palm touch the bottom of the neck. That's obviously number one. Um, but then also making sure that when you're pressing down, your fingers don't like go astray, the ones that you're not using, because uh, that slows you down too. And that that's for bass as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely. Know that for definitely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You want to try to keep uh, your fingers close to the fretboard. And, and there's multiple reasons for that. One, it's again, it's like about conserving energy for sure. Um, and, and also just like developing control of your fingers like the more you focus on keeping them closer to the fretboard the more you're kind of training them to to pay attention to your <laughs> commands so to speak right but um and and this is applicable to both instruments but especially uh for bass and um you know when you get into like uh faster playing or 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 um more, more intricate stuff slap whatever left hand muting starts to become like a really 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 vital part of playing um, so like, you know, with, with bass, with like right hand and, and, you know, our, uh, plucking hand, excuse me. Um, you know, th there's a big, um, I guess focus, uh, on moving your thumb. That's usually what people do. Like when, when you're playing down or up the strings, your thumb should be going from string to string, um, like above the one that you're currently playing to keep things muted. And again, it's really important for bass because it's a low frequency monophonic instrument. So if you start having these open E's and open A's ringing underneath, you know, a, a D sharp uh, major scale, like it's not going to sound good. Um, and especially for recording. So live, you might not really notice that because there's already so much noise in the room and, and sonic real estate has been taken up. So you're kind of not really noticing it, but in the studio, that's where it becomes like really, really evident. Um, so back to the fretting hand too, as far as muting, um, you know, again, if you're playing the bass or the guitar and you're kind of like, let's say you're, you're doing a scale, um, as you are, you know, uh, ascending the scale, um, generally it's going to be probably your index finger. It usually is for me anyway. Um, the tip of that finger, um, maybe it's the middle or whatever is going to be touching the string, um, above the one that you're on. So again, if you're playing the A string, the tip of your index or middle finger should be kind of like touching up a little bit against the E string, um, to, to help with muting. And now obviously your right hand should, or your, okay, your plucking hand. <laughs> Sorry. I, I feel like I'm no, it's okay. Yeah. The we're lefties here. No, um, it's all good. <laughs> but your, your plucking hand should be doing a lot of muting too. Like you mentioned the bridge thing, like kind of that, that meteor side of your palm on the pinky side should be like touching the strings as, as you, you know, move down the string set or up the string set. Um, and, uh, muting, again, is, is just such an important factor for playing because especially the larger the group is, if you're in like a seven or eight piece band, like any extraneous noise is going to mess with the sound. Um, so it's really, really important to, to, uh, watch that. Um, also I would say not just with muting, um, other, other like uh, fretting hand techniques that you should be aware of. Um, Generally, you want to try to make sure that you're pressing the string down like at the fret line, not in the middle of the fret box, you know, uh, like the space between, let's say, the first fret of like a bass. You have the nut and then you have the first fret. Your fingers should be like not on the first fret, like not on top of it, but like just behind it and adjacent to it um, towards like the headstock direction. Um, but any lower than that, you're going to start getting fret buzz. Um, your, your notes can even be like a little bit out of pitch. Um, can I add something? Yeah, well, totally. they're out of pitch because you're, you have more room to, to squeeze too hard and to, uh, to yeah. make it flat mm -hmm. or sharp. So that that's something I've noticed at least with guitar, maybe not bass because no, the I strings are right. really yeah, big. Yeah. I didn't think about it like that. But, but yeah, that's true. I mean you're you're in the valley part. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So of course it's going to be easier if you if you don't have a light touch. It's you're probably going to knock it sharp. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And um, the wrist angle is another thing, and and like thumb positioning. Um, you you shouldn't be baseball gripping the neck. Um, now there are plenty of professional players out there. You, you can, you know, watch videos of people playing and their thumb will be wrapped around the top holding like a bass note or Me. something. Yeah, you do it. You do it for sure. Uh, All Hendrix the time. did it. Um, I mean, Eric clapped it literally like everybody does it. Um, it's more comfortable. And, and this is something that is super controversial in guitar world. But for me, holding bar chords, a whole song is very uncomfortable. Mm. It's way easier to just do the, to do the, the thumb. thumb yeah yeah makes sense That's i mean for me you know everybody's yeah. different whatever works for you and and i think 
especially for chords, that's a lot more acceptable. When you start getting into single note stuff, it's you're just reducing like the amount of stretch that your fingers can have if you do pull back. Like like um, if you're listening um, and not watching, like uh, straighten your wrist out so your hand is like like uh, like a karate chop knife hand, right? And then pull your wrist backwards so that your fingers are, are coming towards the back of your forearm and try to spread them out and then do it the opposite direction and try to spread them out and you'll notice like it's a, a massive difference you got much more spread when you're coming towards the inside of your forearm um so you don't want to be goosenecking either when you're holding the neck somewhere kind of in between generally i mean fr from what i've uh, been told what i've seen and, and, and what i try to tell students is like your hands and wrists should essentially be in like a natural position. So if you're just sitting with your, or, or, you know, with your arms at your side and then you lift them up to hold the neck, that's where it should be. That's how your hand should feel. It shouldn't be all crooked in a weird direction. Um, and you know, if, if you're doing that and it doesn't feel right, then maybe the, that particular guitar isn't the right one for you. Or maybe it's also how you, you're holding your guitar. A lot of people will like hold their guitar straight up against their body, but really a I mean, for me, it's much more comfortable to have a slight angle, yeah, too. Yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, especially before I play something really <clears throat> fast, I usually have to adjust mm -hmm. how I'm standing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that's something that's really hard, too. Um, and I mean, this is probably, most people probably know this, but when you see guitar players like Joey Ramone, is that the... I don't even know. Okay. Well, sorry, Ramones fans. Uh, the guitar <laughs> player for the Ramones, right? So super low. Like at that point, it's so hard to do anything but just basic chords. Oh, the low like, sling. So, yeah. yeah, it's so difficult. So for me, it's kind of a in-between height, right? Mm -hmm. it, just something like you were saying that just feels like how you would hold anything in your hands. Like it should feel natural. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely think angled out is a lot more... Uh, useful yeah and you can go a lot faster and it just feels better also um strap uh, length can can be a really big thing as you're mentioning like low sling versus high sling and if if you love it low and and you want to do that man go for it it but, does look cooler <sighs> i don't know not to me it just no. it looks a little goofy it, it looks like silly to me but i get it i, I think mean, it looks dope yeah, I, I can't play that way, but I, <laughs> I'm not going to say it looks bad. I think it looks cool. Yeah, and, and that's fine, right? It's like, you know, so that said, if especially if you're like a performer, um, so you're not just like, you know, a hobbyist, like hanging out at home playing, and that's fine. Um, but if you are a performer, um, the general like like rule of thumb that, that I've heard, and I try to do this, is your strap height pun intended pun intended your strap height should be set so that when you're sitting down in proper position with good posture and then you stand up that instrument should not move at yeah. all it should be in the exact same spot and this is a thing that i think is important because a lot of people you know they say like oh you should practice standing up and sitting down which is totally true you should definitely do that um as as a string player specifically guitar and bass because generally you're going to be standing up while you play that said um if you do that strap uh rule if you follow that strap rule um strap length rule um then you don't necessarily have to have to practice standing up all the time because your guitar is going to be in the same position and that's why most people suggest that you do the you know standing up and sitting down practice because oh your guitar is going to be in a different spot well if you do it right it it won't so yeah you know so not to be like uh retroactive or whatever but mm -hmm. um i didn't want to interrupt so with guitar left hand muting acoustic versus electric you need to do it for both but mm -hmm. for different reasons i think i mean kind of the same reason but different techniques so for acoustic left hand muting is really important um because when you're playing certain chords, right, you don't want to have to, when you're learning guitar, right, and you're learning like an A chord, right, and for gu guitar players, most everybody knows that one, right, mm -hmm. A major. So when you're learning it, you just know, oh, I'm not going to hit the E string, right? The low E string. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's 
it, when you're learning it, it's easy because you're just strumming whatever. La, mm-hmm. la, la. But when you're actually in a setting where you're digging in, mm-hmm. you're going to hit the E string unless you mute it. Yeah, yeah, so, totally. So with acoustic, like I was saying, obviously, yes, you can play single notes on acoustic. But for the most part, you're going to be a chord rhythm player. Mm-hmm. Right. And then for electric guitar, if you want to practice left hand muting, turn on the craziest distortion that you can find and play anything. <laughs> Literally play anything and you are going to hear every single thing that you need to mute. Yeah. Yeah. In totally, that moment. Totally. You know, so that's, that's how I, that's what I recommend you do. If you want to practice it, literally turn on the most insane metal setting and play literally anything. <laughs> and all of a sudden you will see every single thing that you need to mute. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and that, I remember that when I was learning guitar, anytime I would turn on a metal setting, it would be like, Ugh, everything's ringing and I didn't know how to fix it. Well, it shouldn't be. And that's how you can fix it. Like yeah, you, yeah. you turn it on and you see, oh, I need to mute the low E string because you're playing something on the high strings and it's like, wah, yeah. underneath <laughs> you. And you're just like, why does this sound so bad? Yeah, yeah. So totally. um, that's how I would recommend playing or uh, practicing that for electric guitar. Even if you don't care about metal, it's just a good way to just get in the habit of muting everything it, it just it it accentuates everything that you're not muting. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. not that it's not ringing when you have it on a clean setting it's also ringing but you don't hear it as much yeah um so that's how i'd practice that yeah definitely um, and then for acoustic just go to town like really bear in and bear down on your chords and you'll see you'll see what i mean yeah yeah and, <laughs> and i would say too for that um for acoustic guitar like a lot of the muting um like that you're referring to is, is, is maybe specific to like open chords, like, like an A chord or a D chord where you don't want to hit that open E. And in that case, like it's okay to wrap your thumb around the top a little bit and just kind of touch that E string with your, with your thumb. So you don't have to use your, your strumming hand to do the muting. Um, speaking of technique, uh, stuff and, and, and practice, like once, let's say you're working on something, alternate picking, economy picking, chord strumming, whatever. Um, literally like one of the biggest parts of music is like timing and rhythm, right? Especially if you're going to be playing with other people, you you need to be on the same page. So you definitely want to make sure that you're using a metronome uh, eventually. You don't have to start that way because it can be really intimidating and difficult to try to follow a metronome when you're unfamiliar with a technique and, and you're, you literally haven't developed like the muscle memory and, and the feel for it yet. But once you do, like as soon as you start to feel somewhat comfortable, um, throw on the metronome, and and practice to that practice to a drum beat or something um i would say the metronome just because like those are free like yeah, you can yeah. get a metron any metronome app well not all of them but most of them mm-hmm. are free yeah. you can just go to the app store and get one you can even type in metronome on google there's a google metronome yeah. you just type in metronome and it pulls up so i think it only goes to like 250 beats per minute but i don't think most people need much more than that <laughs> you can subdivide at that point yeah um I need so, yeah. 800 BPM to practice the scale. <laughs> yeah, I have students sometimes that tell me like, oh, yeah, I got this riff up to like 500 beats per minute. Uh, and I'm like, oh, like when you're doing they're, whole they're, notes, they're doing whole notes or quarter notes. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. well, then just do 250 beats per minute at like eighth notes and you'll be good. <laughs> it's the same yeah, yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, chord changes, uh, scales, um, uh, tapping, whatever should be done on the metronome at some point um and also I oh sorry mm, i was ahead. just gonna say with chord changes um learn uh, especially on guitar i get well yeah more than bass mm-hmm. but learn um what how can i change between these chords w- moving the least that i possibly can yeah, which yeah. usually ends up being like learning how to pivot your fingers yes so like going from a to d is actually not that big of a movement yeah. don't take off all your fingers that's <sighs> really the that's that's the killer do of of chord changes and getting them in time yeah. is the, the most especially open guitar chords share something they share a note right mm-hmm. because they're in the same key so, something is still there yeah right yeah. so so really try to figure out like oh C and E minor share a finger I don't have right. to lift up my middle finger mm-hmm. you know what I mean yeah, so yeah, yeah. learning those little things really helps too um, like you were saying with um uh a to d specifically it's like uh your ring finger right so if you're doing an a a chord open a chord you got your index middle ring on the uh d g and b string and then when you switch to d chord that ring finger that's on the b string on the second fret slides up a half step to third and then those other two fingers move so um again finding 
uh, uh, pivot fingers, I guess, is is kind of the most common term yeah, for it, I think. And, and I would say, too, just do it super slow. Yeah. Um, like, so painstakingly slow that you, you're you like, I can do this, like, no longer, <laughs> you know? <Yeah>. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, um, but that really helps. I, I know s- slow it down is always, like, the practice, whatever, but it really is effective. It's so important, guys. <laughs> it's so freaking important. Playing slow is often a lot harder than playing fast too. Like yeah. playing fast really isn't that big of a deal once you get the muscle memory, but playing slow in time in groove, oh man, that's a tough that's tough. Yeah, it's more impressive to play slow actually. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is. don't feel um like you you're not getting anything done mm-hmm. because you definitely are. So also um uh, the the next step in your practice uh, regimen should be ear training. Um and obviously there are I know that there are going to be listeners that are like, well, I don't want to play stuff by ear. I want to have sheet music or tabs. Um, but ear training is going to help you even if you play in an orchestra. Like you're, mm-hmm. it's going to be useful. Yep. Um, just learning how to listen. That's really that's really what it is. And as yeah. a musician, hearing each other and hearing yourself and just listening in general is ninety percent of it. Yep. Like <laughs> For honestly, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. knowing your place in, in a in a band is obviously important, but also just knowing, being able to hear intervals and uh, at the most basic level, right? Knowing when you're out of tune. Yeah, yeah. So you'll hear uh, usually when you're just a little bit out of tune. There's like a little wah 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 wah. So the yeah, closer yeah. that you are in tune, it's slower. Mm-hmm. Wah, wah. and you're literally hearing the sound waves hit each other that's what you're hearing yep so there's pretty cool they're, yeah but i mean that's literally what's happening is it's entering your ear in a different pattern than perfect mm-hmm. so <laughs> so when it's really out of tune you can hear the wah, 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 wah. It, it speeds up mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so just being able to hear that is i would say step one so uh and i think most people can hear that yeah, because it's just it's unpleasant Here. to to the ear, you know. Um, Quick example: so we've got uh, a bass here, open G string, and then D string, right? So I'm gonna hit the fifth fret on the D string, and then the open G. They're pretty much in sync. They're a little bit yeah. wobbly, but now if I put them out, you yeah. can hear that. You can hear that wobble. Right? Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Now it's back. So that's the kind of thing that we're talking about, that that wobble. Um, yeah, and it's you know. just, you know, like I said, it's just sound waves hitting each other, basically. So I would say step one, um, learn to hear that. And and I think, like I said, most people can, but it's, it's still a challenge for mm-hmm. a lot of people. So mm-hmm. being able to know, like, oh, I hear, like, that really fast, blah, 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 like, that means you're probably pretty out of tune. Uh, the closer that you get to being in tune, it will slow down and then eventually it will stop, mm-hmm. which means that you're good again. Yeah. So um, I would say that that's step one. But then also, um, it's so important to learn, um, at least I think, um, intervals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to hear those. I, I mean, I know professional musicians that still can't hear those. So I'm not saying that this is easy by any means or that it's like a beginner step. Or, or that it's make or break. Obviously, like for a career, you can still make a living doing this without having a perfect ear. Sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's really important <laughs> and it can be really helpful if you're wanting to be like a musician that plays out mm-hmm. and plays with other people or even just somebody who, um, you know, um, if you want to be able to hear something and know how to play it quickly. Yes. That's really where it kind of comes in. Yeah. So I, okay, so here's my opinion on the best way the easiest way to do this you Mm -hmm. can do it in numbers right or you can do it in what they call soul fetch so and and it really helps if you can sing and and hold a pitch if you cannot sing in pitch ear training is probably going to be pretty difficult for you yeah um just because your inner hearing is maybe not not great which is fine i mean everybody's different but so if you can sing in pitch uh even if it doesn't sound beautiful that's really the most important thing. So let's just take the major scale. Everybody has heard Soul Fedge if you've seen uh, The Sound of Music. It's Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. That's Soul Fedge. It's a mm-hmm. fancy name for something that everybody knows. So 
you can do it that way. I will say that's not like a very communicative it's not an easy way to communicate with other yeah, people. Yeah, for sure. Like, nobody's going to say, like, oh, go to the me. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're, they're going to say, go to the three. So if you took do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, and did it in numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or one, eight and one's the same thing. We haven't done the music theory episode yet, but let's just, they're the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, we've done a little bit. We've done yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but, yeah, so, yeah. So, um, Doing it in numbers is a lot more effective because I, I will say like people will say, oh, go to the three. Mm-hmm. You're you're going to hear that, but nobody's ever going to say go to the me. So yeah. soul fetch sings prettier, but it's not quite as is useful. Yeah, in, in real life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so being able to hear those pitches is so important. So the way that I started practicing that is I would sing along while I played the major scale. Mm-hmm. So you, if you have a piano, do it in C. No black keys, just dum, 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 right? And then you can do it backwards. But singing with it is training your muscles Yeah, to, yeah. to know those. And you're actually training your ear while you're doing that. Then the next step I that I did was sing it and then check yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of times, I, if, especially at first, I was sharper flat. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I would hit the key, I would hear that wah, 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 wah. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I thought out. I was right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know? yeah totally. Um, so that's going to happen. At least it did for me. Um, and then once you kind of get the hang of that, which it is, it's it's hard, right? Yeah. But just start with a major scale. Once you get the hang of that, you'll start jump being able to kind of jump around. So one, four, three, one, six, five, one sharp, seven, one, mm-hmm. flat, seven, one. You know, and you can kind of work all around in it, which yeah. is challenging. I, yep. mean, I mean, it's weird um, and it takes a while and I'm definitely not like the best at it, but I'm still practicing it myself. Yeah. yeah um, but I, sure. I will tell you, like, it's really helped me with my ear training because now I've gotten to the point where I can listen to a song and I'm like, oh, yeah, I know what they're doing. Yeah. And I can pretty much just play it. You could you could never have played the song in your life and you you just by listening to it, you can pick up an instrument and know where you're supposed to go as soon as you get a reference pitch, you know, if you, if you don't have like perfect pitch, you know, or, or, and, and for, I would say for a lot of guitar players and bass players, um, like certain notes, um, it be your relative pitch becomes so good with those notes that it's, it mimics perfect pitch. So for example, like a lot of the time I can hear a song and I know right away it's an E because I know what an open E on the bass and the guitar sounds like because I've just played it so long, 17 or so years that like this sound of an E, the oscillation, the tone and the, the, just the whole thing just immediately I can recognize it. And, and you know, I can't do that with every note, but usually like open string notes, because if anything, you've been tuning your whole life. So like you really get used to hearing that note. And for those of you that do play guitar and bass, like that's a great place to start. Maybe if if you've never really like practiced singing and you don't feel very confident in it, um, st- starting working on like singing those open string notes, maybe just to kind of internalize that feel. And and you're gonna know when it's out. I think you know most people um, will, will know when it's right. out. Yeah, and 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 so I think the intervals, like like I was saying, single notes is really where I mean it's where I started. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I'm not. I'm not a wizard at it, but like I have gotten a lot better. Mm. Um, And then from there, you can kind of work up to chords, right? And chords are a lot harder. I'm not going to lie. Like there's a lot of chords out there. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And especially when you get into like the jazz world where they start adding weird notes. So, so here's a good example. So if you do play guitar, most people know like the major chords are just where you see the letter. Mm-hmm. Right. If it mm-hmm. says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that's a major chord. Mm-hmm. If it has a little M beside it, that's a minor chord. So kind of just real quick, major chords, this is kind of stereotypical, but they usually sound really happy. Mm-hmm. Minor chords sound sad. That's the easy way to say it. People would disagree. It depends on the context. But basically, if you played it for a little kid, like we said in another episode, mm-hmm. like that's kind of usually the answer that you get. Right. So then if you ever see numbers beside it those are like extended chords Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of what I mean when I say jazz chords and then the more numbers the more jazzy it gets (laughs) so so you know when you start doing like 13s and sharp 11s and yeah eventually you will be able to hear those but I'm not gonna lie a lot of times when people play those I still get confused I'm like ooh, is that augmented or 
like a, oh, I know, a sharp left. You know what I mean? I know a lot of people that that uh, specifically like have an issue hearing the difference between augmented and and diminished um, because they're both odd sounding mm. and they they don't sound like minor and major chords. So it's like, oh, what is that? But like, yeah. So, for so sure. to explain that basically to people, mm -hmm. if you don't know. Uh, diminished is where the fifth note of the scale, right? So your soul, do, re, mi, fa, sol, is flat, and that's a diminished chord. And, well, and it, the three is minor as well. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the difference between diminished and augmented is flat five, sharp five. And major three and minor three. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's kind of like the music theory thing. But we'll get into that in another episode. But yeah. I just kind of wanted to explain it because people are probably like, augmented, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so I'm not going to lie. Those chords are um, really challenging to hear because they kind of sound nasty. Yeah. So Dissonance. people, people yeah. know that they sound nasty, but they don't know why or what it is. Mm -hmm. So that's more like advanced. But if you could just first, I would say with chords, be able to distinguish major or minor. That would be step one. Yeah. Yeah. So being able to hear it and be like, oh, yeah, that sounds happy. That's a major chord. Oh, that sounds sad. That's a minor chord or mm -hmm. however you want to define it. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, the, I'm giving elementary words here, but I would say that that's step one. And then kind of applying your your interval work to the chords. So then knowing like, oh, that's the root chord. So yeah. if you're in the key of A, knowing like, oh, that's the one. Mm -hmm. That's the A chord. So if you're in the key of C, the one would be a C chord, right? So um, knowing that would be step two, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then kind of knowing where the chords kind of go from that in the key. So knowing like, oh, yeah, that's a minor three. That's a major four, major five, perfect fifth, right? So right. being able to hear that is, is really challenging. Um, the main advice that, I, that I've that i strove for, I guess, or mm -hmm. that I strive for um, is to really listen to the bass note. That's the yeah. most important note. So you can, if you can hear where the bass note is, that's usually going to be, so, so coming from interval training, right? Knowing if, if that's where we started. So knowing like, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, knowing that if you can listen to the bass note, because bass is monophonic and it's playing, well, let's just say it, it is playing the roots. Then you can know like, no me oh he's on the three mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm, what i mean yeah um so that's really helpful um and that's kind of where i would start with chord understanding chords and yeah. with ear training is listen to the bass note which is uh, also it's kind of funny too because like you know as for bass players that's usually the first thing we are listening to that said if you want to get beyond playing just root notes all the time then that's why like knowing this stuff and, and training your ear to hear this stuff is really important because, you know, if you're trying to write a bass line, you like you want to know how to be able to distinguish between a minor chord and a major chord. Because if they're playing an A major and then you hit a C natural, like mm -hmm. it's going to be bad. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going to sound great uh, unless you pickerty third that that C into a C sharp. But even then, like, you know, Bow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, on a fretless, it might sound cool, but <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah. not. Um, yeah. So yeah, for sure. For sure. It's, it's definitely listen to the bass note, try to find that and then, you know, build off of that, so to speak. Yeah. And then I would say, push yourself when you're working on ear training, try to learn every song by ear Yep. for, for a while. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously if you get stuck and you're like really getting frustrated and whatever, you can look up the tabs or the sheet music, mm -hmm. but really, really try to do it by ear. And there's really no excuse of why you couldn't because you can go on YouTube and slow it down. I mean, there's so many, there's so many programs now where you can yeah. do like half speed. So slow it down to 50% and really try to do it by ear, even mm -hmm. if it's super speedy, fast and crazy. Mm -hmm. um, that is so helpful. Um, is. Just in kind of developing, even if you don't want to, you don't care about what the names of the notes are, right? You don't care about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Like it, it's really important to just at least be able to hear it. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. Even if you don't care what, what it is actually like music theory terms. Um, so try to push yourself to try to learn songs like that. Um, and then also like, um, I, I guess what I'm like, don't don't feel like you have to be like perfect with this at first. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah, yeah. going to be bad for a while, like anything else, like yep. you're going to struggle with it. Um, but something that I'll do too, uh, when I was learning 
to use my ear to do chords, right? Chords mm -hmm. are always harder because it's multiple notes at the same time. It's really hard to hear. I will listen to the chord and try to sing every note that I'm hearing, which is really hard. Yeah. But if you... Mm, 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 mm. I'm like, oh, that's the weird nice. note. Yeah. So, so <laughs> then I know like, oh, I got a dominant chord. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. being able to sing it and just pick around uh, if you're on a guitar or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's kind of a, a skill, but it really helps you. It's pushing you. It's yeah. using your ear to like, oh, that's what that chord sounds like. And it, it's all helpful for the same reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you were talking about earlier, you film yourself when you're working on... Well, generally, no, I don't actually do this a lot. I've, I've just heard, um, like, uh, you know, advice before where, like, people say, you know, not necessarily for ear training, but, you know, this could be for ear training, but more so for technique. Um, I've heard that, like, filming yourself so you can watch it back later and, and look at what your hand's doing and making sure that you're, like, on the right, uh, on the right path. Um, but I have noticed it, like if I've filmed like a video for like Instagram or something and then I'm, I'll put it up and I'll be like, oh man, my left hand doesn't look right. I need to fix that. You know, so it can be really helpful for sure to, to actually physically see what you're doing. Cause sometimes when you're, when you're practicing something, um, it, you know, it's harder to, to realize when you're doing something wrong, when you're in the moment. So that can apply to ear training too, because like sometimes it's hard to hear if you're playing something out of, out of key or, or out of pitch or singing something out of pitch in that moment. So maybe filming yourself singing along to a backing track or something to, to go back and see, okay, you know, where am I losing myself? Where am I getting out of, of key or, you know, creating a, a negative dissonance, you know? Um, I mean, yeah. I still have a flyaway pinky. I, I see that when I, <laughs> yeah, when yeah. I look back at videos, I'm like, damn it, that shouldn't be there. But it happens, you know, I mean, I wouldn't know unless I feel myself because yeah. in the moment you're just like, you're not even paying attention. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I still have that sometimes. It mm -hmm. just sticks straight out like I'm having tea time. <laughs> A fancy guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, ear training is, is really, really important, kind of no matter what your goals are. Mm -hmm. um, so work on it. Yeah. Um, don't, don't feel like it's going to happen overnight. It is literally the longest process. I think of out of anything that we're talking about, because it's literally internalized music. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's hard. You know, so it, it's not going to happen and quickly. There is actually real quick uh, to throw this in there before we move on. Um, there's an app that I've uh, used before um, called Perfect Ear. And it's just an ear training app. So it'll it, it starts you. It's like doing Duolingo. Like it starts you at a really basic level, gives you some vocabulary to work with. And then, you know, it'll do some note comparison and then it'll start getting more complicated, like, you know, um, hitting like. Uh, a, a note and then like hitting the the major ninth an oct two octaves high or an octave high and then hitting the minor nine like an octave low and you have to figure out like which one it is you know if or, or you know which one came first or which one's higher which one's lower things like that so it's actually a pretty cool little app perfect ear um that sounds hard it's it's pretty i need cool. to get that yeah it's actually a pretty dope app. <laughs> that sounds really hard yeah. <laughs> um yeah so um it's really important to work on. So another important thing uh, when you're practicing, obviously this is kind of obvious, but uh, review, right? So so play songs that you haven't played for a while or play songs that you already know, mm -hmm. uh, but not even songs like techniques that you already know. Um, like we've said a million times, really playing an instrument is mostly muscle memory. So it's kind of, if you don't use it, you will lose it. Like yeah, it, it's a thing. For sure. Like I, I can't tell you how many times I've only practiced a song one time mm -hmm. and I nailed it, but then I couldn't play it again. Oh, all the time. Yeah. yeah. All the time. So, so if you don't commit it to memory, it's going to not be there. <laughs> I mean, it, it's going to go away. Like that's just, it's yeah. just true. Totally. Totally. Um, totally. And then, you know, obviously, like we were saying, use a metronome do it over and over. Um, Memorize is a huge thing. So like, you know, especially if you're like an orchestral player or, or somebody who's who's using notation a lot, that doesn't mean you should not memorize the music because um, what, what happens if your music gets lost or a page falls off the music stand or your, like most, most people are probably using like iPads now. So your iPad dies or whatever. Like you, you want to not be dependent on the, the sheet music. I mean, I will say too, even besides just like, losing or you know having a malfunction like when you're paying attention to charts or sheet music 
you're usually not listening as well as you would if mm. you didn't have it there. True, true, like true, you're true. paying attention to that, you know, you're yeah. reading it instead of it's, it would be like reading a speech, but you're not really understanding what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like reading off a teleprompter, but you have no idea what you're actually reading. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's kind of that same idea. So um, at least in my opinion. So I think it's really important um, at least to get like a general memorization of if you're using sheet music so that you can really listen to everybody else. Um, Because when you're sight reading or reading sheet music, you're more concerned about you, um, which is not uh, that's not what you're there for. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You know, you're you should listen to each other and communicate with other people. Um, So don't just be concerned about your tabs or your sheet music. Um, which I think memory, like memorizing really helps with. Yeah. It just gives you the opportunity to, you already have it. It's under your hands. It's under your fingers. Now you can listen to everybody else and fit and talk to them Mm -hmm. basically through music. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think review is pretty obvious, you know, just do practice what you did yesterday today. That's basically the idea. Yeah, Um, for sure. But I will say too, like try every single time you practice to learn something new Mm -hmm. like it doesn't have to be a a whole song it can literally just be like a new technique or a new pattern new chord yeah take a scale that you know and instead of doing it in threes do it in fives Uh, you know what i mean i do that all the time just because so so guitar solos right and this is something i tell students all the time they're literally just scales and patterns yep I mean, you can't like, obviously you can create melodies with them, but like shreddy guitar stuff where people mm-hmm. are like, whoa, that's nuts. It's literally just a scale and a pattern. Yeah. Like it's literally, I, I do threes all the time. I like triplets. So I do yeah, threes yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah. But um, sure. back to the Eric Johnson thing, he's most famous for doing fives. Right. Yeah. So, so everybody kind of has their own patterns, but just take a scale that, you know, super well and learn a new way to play it. Yeah. Yeah. Or sequence the interval, yeah. things like that. Or yeah, interval, yeah. Excuse me. But I mean, you know, push yourself. Don't let something, don't pick something that's going to discourage you. Obviously, like if you're a true beginner. Maybe don't start with Master of Puppets. <laughs> yeah. Or like, or Cliffs of Dover, going back to Eric Johnson. Yeah, like, yeah. it's just not, I mean, yeah, you can, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying, but if, if you're the kind of person that gets discouraged when you don't get something immediately, just set like realistic expectations. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, try to learn something that that will encourage you to keep practicing Definitely. and that you will enjoy practicing. Um, two, like, don't dwell if you do mess up. Don't dwell on mistakes. Yeah. Because um, it's gonna happen. Yeah, as <laughs> we always time. say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna happen all um, the time. But you just have to learn to kind of move past those. Speaking of that, actually, just a quick note that I think is important to keep in mind. Um, when you are practicing something, um, whether it's new or something you've done a whole lot, um, usually this happens with something that's new, I think. Um, a lot of people have a tendency, like if they hit a wrong note, they they um, they kind of get lost or, or they start the whole thing over. Like you need to start training yourself to play through the mistake. Um, and, and that's kind of like the secret to like all of the best like like – prodigy musicians prodigy in in quotes because you know that's a very specific example but like anyone who's just really really skilled at their craft like they screw up a lot too uh, as like on stage but they're just really good at recovery um and so you want to train yourself for that recovery so if you're going through a scale and you're playing a you know a minor pentatonic a c d e if you accidentally hit an e flat just keep going don't don't then go to the E if you're trying to like work on your timing and get through the scale or match up to a, you know, a track or something. Just go to the next note, play through it. Yeah. And I, I want to encourage you to like this has been really important for me. And I I like to think that I'm a really versatile guitar player. Like I think I could pretty much play you with any. <laughs> I think I could play with anybody yeah. and at least like fit in to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, so push yourself to learn different styles. Like even if you really love metal and like that's your thing learn a country song like learn a country technique learn how to chicken pick learn how to hybrid which is just hybrid picking but Mm -hmm. like it's gonna pay off like look at john five like people are amazed that he's a metal guitar player that can play chicken picking better than brad paisley you know what i mean or as good as brad paisley Uh like people love it yeah so pushing yourself and it's just gonna make you a better player 
Yeah. And it opens the door. You can play with more people and you can get more gigs. And even if that's not your your jam, like it, it really will push you as a guitar player. Like yeah. I grew up loving rock music, but there was like a period of time where I was like, I'm going to work on my Jerry Reed and Chet Atkins. Yeah. Like I'm going to work yeah. on that. And so I did. And so like now people are like, oh, you know that song? That's so cool. And I'm like, yeah, I went through, <laughs> I went through a minute, you know, yeah. in my practice. Yeah. 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 So I uh, push yourself. Um, cause it will kind of expand your techniques yeah. so much. Like even basic, like the way that a jazz player plays a major seven chord is totally different than how a rock player would play a major yeah, seven chord. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, it's just a different positioning, you know, but being able to do both is really cool. And it just kind of opens up the door to just different stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's really what, that's, the, yeah. that's the whole thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, and, and if you want to like, as a guitar player, if you're, if you're, let's say you're really good at like shreddy guitar licks, like, um, you know, pentatonic riffs and, and Aeolian scales and harmonic minor scales. I and feel all attacked. The, you know, no, so I'm, I'm <laughs> saying like, you know, if, if that's your bag, like, and that's the kind of thing you do. And I think for most guitar players, like it probably is cause that's kind of where guitar fits in a lot of the time. But, um, if you want to get like, if you're getting bored of your solos and you feel like, you know, you're, you're not growing anymore, start transcribing, uh, like horn solos, like, some of the best solos are horn solos and and i think victor wooten says uh this um that he feels that way because they have to stop to breathe so like they have to be very mm -hmm. intentional about everything they play they have to think ahead and i think that can that can really make your solos and and your licks and melodies much more unique as a string player um because you're going to be thinking in a different headspace i would say singers too singers too yeah, uh, yeah like yeah. more like in the soul realm like i've transcribed some like aretha franklin runs mm. for guitar and it's pretty weird like yeah. you don't think to to go there but the human voice just she hear, she hears it yeah you know before mm -hmm. she sings it whereas we're so used to as guitar players at least like we learn a certain position and this is the way we're going to play it. Like yeah, you don't think yeah. to kind of jump around to weird places a lot of the time. Cause it's like I said, it's muscle memory. So You're if you haven't patterns, done it, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't done it, you won't. Um, um, and then one thing that's really cool um, for guitar and some people are like really hardcore about this. I'm not quite so much, but it is super useful is to learn like the caged theory. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's basically learning your chord positions for each chord all the way up the neck. Yep. So knowing how to play an A when you're on the ninth fret or yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so that would be really helpful to yeah, you. Like the, the so seat. you don't have to jump all the way down here yeah, to exactly, play an A, exactly. you know, they're, they're all over the neck. That's the funny thing about guitar is there's 10 ways to play the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, so learning that kind of stuff is really useful. It is. And especially like the, the G shape and C shape for guitar are like, that's kind of the secret to sweet picking uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Like, like if you want to do like a really fast major arpeggio, like it's the C shape, but yeah. it's just higher up on the neck. Exactly. So definitely like, like learning that can be super helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I guess the basic idea is um, in, in your practice routine, try to kind of split it up. Like we were saying, you don't have to write it down. It doesn't have to be formal, but do push yourself to to split it up and really try to make the most out of it, right? This is the, the time you've taken out of your day to get better at your craft. Mm -hmm. So try to... Um, like I said, split it up and do your best. Be patient, slow it down, um, be kind to yourself. Like it's literally just you and a guitar or, yeah. or whatever instrument. So it doesn't have to be perfect. Nobody's watching. That's the best part about practice is yeah. you can mess up all day long and you're going to get better at it. Um, you know, but practice itself can be a real hassle for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so we just wanted to encourage you to um, try to think of new ways to kind of make it exciting and interesting and like efficient and effective for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, speaking of that, like, you know, uh, another thing with with practice and, and like making it more fun is like you can turn a scale run like you know, a major scale, like, da, 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 and then make it more musical on like the bass, for example, bum, 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 ba -da -da -dum, ba -da -dum. right. And then all of a sudden you're still practicing your skill, uh, your scale, you're still practicing like the motion, but now it's a little more fun and musical and you, in and, and you've written a bass line, you know, so find, find ways to keep it fresh and interesting so that you don't get stuck in the slog of just, you know, rudiments and routine and pattern, because that's not, I mean, music can be 
uh, viewed uh, as a pattern Mm because it is. I mean, it's definitely a pattern. It's all math. It's all, you know, frequencies and stuff. But like, that's not why we like music. (laughs) We like music because it it feels good and it sounds good and and it's interesting. Right. So keep it interesting for sure. Be adventurous. Yeah. yeah. Have fun with your practice. It doesn't have to suck so bad. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it is what it is, but it doesn't have to be awful. Yeah. So um, I hope that you guys got a lot from this and I hope that your practice goes well. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Sex, Drugs, and Disappointment. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to leave us a review and connect with us more on Instagram and TikTok at SDD Podcast. Each episode is also available in video format on YouTube. And don't forget, have fun, don't do too much, and it's going to happen.